Chapter 16, Second Coming Out. About coming out, which I've done twice in my life. It's less about coming out and more about pe letting people in. I learned that you come out to people to let people in. The reality is, the closet doesn't only hide you from strangers. The closet also hides you from the people you love. For more than a decade, I hid my Filipino family from my white family of mentors and allies. And I hid my friends from both of them. It was easier to keep everyone apart. Many members of my Filipino family did not know or did not want to know that I was gay. Most of my closest friends did not know that I was undocumented. I compartmentalized people like I compartmentalized my feelings. To celebrate my 30th birthday, the day my driver's license from Oregon was set to expire, I decided it was time for everyone to meet everyone. I threw myself and I may get deported party to share my decision to come out as undocumented with the goal of sparking a more honest, more inclusive conversation about immigration and the millions of people many Americans deem illegal. In front of everyone I loved, I said that I was not sure what would happen to me. Arrest, detention, deportation. But what I did not know was that I needed all of them to know each other. Most people in the room had an idea of what I was planning on doing. That night, many of them told me they didn't really believe it until I shared it in front of the whole group. I was hoping you changed your mind, my friend Scott told me. 30 people showed up, traveling in from all over the country. With the help of my Aunt Jennifer, I had organized a dinner at an Indian restaurant in downtown San Francisco. Lola came, accompanied by Uncle Roland, his wife, Alma, and their children, AJ and Nicole. Lola's sister, Florida, attended, as did several aunts, uncles, and cousins, including Ida, my exuberant aunt, Annie Gladys, and Ate Gladys, a cousin who's more like the older sister I never had. All my mentors from Mountain View High School showed up. After meeting Pat, Rich, Sherry, Mary, Daisy, and Jim for the first time, Lola turned to me and said, Indiko alam na puta pala laha. I didn't know they were all white. Beloved friends from New York City and Washington, D.C. made the trip. My reporter reporting career had been guided by editors who became mentors and later very dear friends. It was a special thrill to introduce Teresa Moore, the editor who helped me get a job at the Chronicle, to Marsha Davis, who edited most of my work at the Post. As people mingled with each other through the buffet, dinner of chicken curry, samosas, Irani, and naan, I realized that I had made a mistake by keeping everyone apart all these years. I was afraid that they wouldn't have anything to talk about. It was not until my family life, my school life, and my work life all converged in that Indian restaurant that I discovered that they indeed had something in common, their generosity to me. And to be seen by so many people, so many good people, meant that I was here, and maybe even that I was supposed to be here. Uncle Conrad, who flew in from San Diego, pulled me aside and told me he was overwhelmed after meeting everyone. Your whole life is here, he said. Not my whole life. Lolo had been gone for four years. He died of a heart attack in January 2007. I was glad that we were able to reconcile months before he died to get to an understanding about why he did what he did and why I did what I had to do. I apologized for all the hurtful things I said. I apologized for being rebellious and disobedient, for running, running away from him, thinking that he resented whatever it was I had become. Turns out he didn't resent it. He just didn't understand it. Indiko alam na mangayari ang lahat ng paitop apoko. I didn't know all of this would happen, my grandson. Lola wasn't the only major figure in my life who was absent from the party. Two months after we buried Lolo, my father, whom I hadn't seen since I was about 11 years old, was dying from lung cancer. I found out when his siblings found a way to contact me, first by email and then by phone. They needed to help in paying for my father's funeral. At first, I didn't know what to do. I was angry. And I was angry that I was angry. When the anger subsided, the only appropriate thing to do was to send whatever extra money I had to the man who was partly responsible for my being born.